Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I am coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM T Tools Network for short, which is part of Octo. Um, and I have also on the webinar my colleague, Ray Evrard, who's project manager for Octo. She's helping me uh, co-host this webinar. Uh, and we are incredibly pleased to have John Fisher with us. John is currently with the Pew Charitable Trust, um, although most of the work that, with, that he's going to be presenting on uh, here was done while he was at the Nature Conservancy. He uh, recently moved over to uh, Pew. Um, so he's going to be speaking today about producing impactful research. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know that um, you can ask questions um, or provide comments to uh, the audience um, through the chat, the chat box. You can see um, the um, your window. You can type in questions for John, or if you have um, pertinent comments relevant to the, the webinar, you can post them there and, and send, uh, but you could send it directly to us if you choose panelists, or you could send it to the wider audience. And please use that wisely. And um, and also if you do once, you can send questions into the Q&A also, we'll also be checking that. So there's two ways to send in questions. Um, so. And, and feel free to send in questions during the presentation. The presentation is going to be about 20 minutes, and we're going to have plenty of time for uh, question and answer afterwards. So uh, we're very glad you could all be with us. OK, John, I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Well, thank you all for joining. Thanks for all the interest. Really excited to be here. And I see, I was just keeping an eye on the participant list. I see several people that gave invaluable feedback and, and input into this process. So thank you all as well for being here and for your your interest. Um, so yeah, so like I said, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and then I'm really hoping that most of the time will be for discussion, not just kind of Q&A, but I'd love to hear about what do you think we got right, what's wrong, how does this apply to your own experience, and just kind of have a, a really open discussion. So with that, I'll dive in and I wanted to begin by just talking about what got me motivated to work on this topic in the first place. So is there anything more heartbreaking than seeing something wasted that somebody else desperately needs? So for example, we waste $165 billion in food every year in the United States. So this picture was taken in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and this is just a bunch of perfectly edible food that was pulled out of dumpsters in one afternoon. And that cost isn't just a financial cost, right? We're not just talking about losing money because we also have 40 million Americans who are food insecure. So this gentleman's name is David. He's from Manhattan. And again, he, he was part of one of these events where they pull a bunch of good food out of the trash and he got to eat on a day he otherwise wouldn't have. And that's what makes this waste so hard is we're losing something that we really need elsewhere. And while um, it's not as fundamental as food, we in many ways have a similar problem with research. A lot of research doesn't get read or doesn't get used. And if it's not being used, arguably it's wasted. So let's talk about that a bit. Many of you probably saw this report from the World Bank several years ago where they did an analysis of their own research and they found 31% of their articles had never been downloaded a single time and 87% had never been cited. And there's been some similar work, similar work in the peer reviewed literature finding that many papers are only read by the editor and the peer reviewers. So think about for a moment, that's, that's almost a third of the research that never even got a single pity download from a friend or a colleague or a family member. And while much of that research may well have been printed out and shared in any ways, in other ways, it's also likely that a lot of it just missed its mark and didn't have the impact that the researchers intended. So what are some of the reasons for that? Well, let me start with, with two unfair stereotypes of why. On the one hand, we have this notion that there's ivory tower scientists. So this cartoon is saying, you know, our job is just to study nature, you go and save it. Um, and on the other end, we have kind of, you know, willfully ignorant decision makers that don't care about science or evidence. But what's the reality? Well, researchers, as, as you all probably know, are often legitimately worried about things like dumbing down their science, about balancing their independence and their rigor with being relevant and with being advocates, or they might just lack the skills to have more impact. And then conversely, on the decision maker side, and again, these are not my views, these are sort of unfair stereotypes I'm putting here on the screen, um, decision makers might be unaware of science, they might not have access to it, they may not understand it, and they may view it as irrelevant, either because the wrong science was done, or they might view other things like public consensus as more important or equally important to science and evidence. But the reality is that most decision makers want to use the best available evidence to make their decisions, and most conservation scientists want to have more impact through their research. 
I should note there are many ways scientists have impact beyond research, and the focus of this talk is, is just on the research side. And so what really got me excited about this topic was that I've been on both sides of this. I've been a researcher, you know, where you write a grant and you do the research, and four years later you have a paper and you realize that it didn't really matter and you didn't have the impact you wanted. And I've also been working with decision makers who have really important decisions to make, very short time frames, and really struggled to find the science they needed. And so that got us thinking. There are relatively few how-to guides that make explicit recommendations for scientists using accessible language that doesn't require knowing the entire body of literature on this. There are some, and in doing this work, I've, I've found others. So I convened a group of about 10 people, and I believe some of them may be on this call, um, to think through how we might solve this a couple years ago. And after about a year and a half of kind of brainstorming and winnowing through ideas and getting input, we ended up with four of us that actually stuck with it to produce a paper, which is currently in review at a journal. So that's myself, Stephen Wood at The Nature Conservancy, Mark Bradford at Yale, and Rod Kelsey at The Nature Conservancy. And I don't believe any of them could make it today, although if they are, they can speak up through the chat. We then took this idea, so we kind of came up with a core set of recommendations for scientists, and we ran it through about 20 peer reviewers. Um, two of those were non-scientists, so we had some science communicators, had my wife read it, and then we ran it through a whole bunch of people who work, work in the field. And through that refinement, we ended up with sort of some high-level recommendations, and I'll, I'll walk through them briefly, and then we'll dive in a bit more. So here's sort of the summary diagram of the paper, and I, I put a link at the beginning of the full paper, and I'll have it at the end as well. But so at a high level, we kind of have four overall steps that we recommend. The first is identifying and understanding who your audience is. And I'll note audience is probably not the right word. Partner is probably better, but both words have, have caused some uh, ambiguity or some trouble, so we'll, we'll dive into that a bit. But really, who is it that you want to read your research and act on it? Next is clarifying the need for evidence or thinking about the decision space. So what's gonna happen once you have your new evidence or your new research? Third is gathering just enough evidence. So we often think about having science not be rigorous enough or being too quick and dirty, but there's also a cost of overdoing it with science. There's opportunity cost when we spend too much on detail we don't need. And then finally, making sure we spend the time we need to share and discuss the evidence. We all know that people don't typically just find our research in the literature, at least decision makers often don't, but many of us um, still don't spend the time that we probably need to communicate it. So again, that's kind of at a high level. Um, and for each of these topics in the paper, we explain why it's important, how you can do it, and what you should know once it's done. A really key point here I wanna make is this is not the one true way. We, we don't feel like we got tablets that said, this is the only way to have research impact, or this is the ideal way. This is a framework and a set of guidelines that we think are helpful, and that again, through a process of extensive peer review, we've refined and we think is pretty good. Um, but it's not a strict recipe for success. It's not easy to do. You don't have to follow every step. It's just a series of things for you to consider that we believe will help you have more impact. So with that, I'm gonna dive into each of these four. And then, as I said, we'll have uh, plenty of time for discussion. So starting with, with your audience or again, your partners. So many of us think, well, we want to inform decision makers or policy makers, but you really have to be able to put a, a specific name or a set of faces to the audience you want to, to work with. And the next part is, again, we often think of who you want to inform, but ideally research works best when it's a collaborative process. So there's, there's a lot of, of work in the literature on, on knowledge co-production. And so the idea here is you figure out who it is you want to work with, and you work with them to identify and clarify a problem of mutual interest that's a priority for both of you. So rather than being a science salesperson saying, I've got some really good research you should use, and rather than just being a technician who says, hey, I'll do whatever you want, really working together and figuring out what's the research that they need and how can it best be designed to be as useful as possible. And then the third point here is that it's also really important to engage in a community of practice that you're wanting to influence especially those of us that work in conservation, we often tend to be pretty interdisciplinary and work in a lot of different areas. And when we move into new spaces, it's really important to know who are all the different people working on this, the scientists, you know, what are the, the technical bodies that are working, who are the stakeholders, and really taking time to get to know what conversations are already happening before you go in and, and seek to add to it. So our, our next section here is around the need for evidence. And again, this, this could also be thought of as, as the decision space. So the first question, does the audience see that there's an evidence gap and why or why not? So for example, if you were to take climate change for a moment, while there are still some people who don't believe climate change is happening, probably most of us would agree that that's not because of a lack of data. There are not many people saying, well, I don't think this has been studied. 
There might be a trust gap or a communication gap or a whole range of other problems, but probably the added value of, of doing one more study showing that climate change is happening is, is relatively small. So thinking about whether or not research is really what's missing or if it's more of an implementation problem will help you understand whether or not there's really the potential to have impact with research. Next is thinking about what actions are being considered and at what spatial or temporal scales. So rather than just answering a question that's fundamental, we're often trying to help a decision maker distinguish between a few different choices they have. And so understanding what those choices are helps you understand what information they need to distinguish between them. Third is, is asking whether new evidence will suffice to drive action. So this is in some ways similar to the first one. In some cases you might say, hey, I've, I've done a great analysis. I can tell you that the most impactful way to boost your crop yields and reduce greenhouse gases is as follows. And you might present that to a country, uh, you know, maybe a, a governor or a minister, and they might say, wow, I'm really glad to know that. That's really useful, but our budget is zero dollars and we have no ability to implement any programs whatsoever. And so when you're working in an area where, where information isn't the limiting factor, but it's capacity or resources or something else, again, you've got to think about whether or not your research is going to be useful or whether there's, there's something else you need to do to kind of work on those enabling conditions before you take on the research. And then finally, taking a moment to think through all those actions and translate that into specific research questions. So with that, I want to take a moment to pause and before get diving into the details of the paper again, I want to talk about when this topic of gathering just enough evidence became really real for me. So the picture I'm showing here is of the town of Camboriú in Brazil. It's a beautiful coastal tourist town and they had this really interesting problem. So they were not having, sorry, they were having water shortages and there was this concern that in the not too distant future, they would have tourists coming into town, turn on the tap and nothing would come out. It's really a serious threat if you rely on tourism. And so they had this notion that one way to solve the problem was to work on a water fund. So the shortages were partly driven by a water quality problem. And so the idea here is rather than just building more infrastructure for water treatment, what if we paid people for things like changing their land management so they didn't cut down trees or replanting riparian buffers of grass and trees, changing their farming practices. And hopefully in working in that way, we could more efficiently reduce the water quality problems. And at the same time, we get nature co-benefits. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there was a group of scientists that worked on this and we were like kids in a candy store. So here's a high level image. The details aren't important, but we went all in on, how, on this exciting science. So we were doing half meter satellite imagery. We classified land cover and translated that into land use. I was modeling future land cover change. So kind of predicting what's gonna be lost. And we translated that into sediment loading using a SWOT model and looked at the engineering side and treatment costs and return investment with all this economic analysis. At the end of the day, we've done all this really cool science and we said, look, we can show you that nature makes sense. We've, if you invest in the water fund, it's going to pay for itself after 40 years. And there's all these great co-benefits. You're going to get carbon and biodiversity and, you know, more opportunity for tourism. <clears throat> we felt really good about it. <clears throat> but at the same time, I started wondering what would have happened if we'd done a much simpler analysis? So every time I did one of the modeling runs to predict future land cover change, it took about two weeks of processing time. And I got to wonder what would have happened if I'd used simpler data. So here's a quick example of what that looks like. So on the right, we have this half meter imagery and on the left is 30 meter data from Landsat. So it's the same area within Brazil. And you can see the basic patterns are pretty similar, but if you look down, that's an inset, one little subset of the image. And you can see you do lose a lot of detail. <clears throat> so the question was, would the answer change if we'd done this much simpler? Cause that 30 meter run took about three hours versus two weeks. So here's the answer. When we, when we did the analysis, we found that about 28% of the land use was different. So we might mistake pasture for rice or a forest for plantation by using the coarser data. And when we went through the economic analysis, it turns out that using the coarser data, we would have mistakenly thought that the return on investment was never over one. So we would have had the wrong conclusion. We would have thought that nature didn't actually make sense financially, wouldn't have paid for itself. And so we did that analysis and we felt really good. It's a good thing we did all this science and got the right answer. But then we actually were talking to the decision makers and it turns out we actually had the wrong question from the beginning. So we thought the question was, should you invest in nature or invest more in the water treatment plant, you know, the gray infrastructure. But it turned out that wasn't actually the choice they were facing. So it turned out that the, in, in this particular area, they'd kind of about hit the limits of what they could do with their current treatment plant. And so their options were either the water fund or they're looking at building a pipeline to a neighboring watershed. It's going to be slow and expensive 
and they were, there were some concerns that over the long run, they had some of the same problems with, with deforestation that would eventually lead to water quality problems there as well. So the question for them wasn't, is nature going to pay for itself? The question is, is the idea of the water fund more or less sound? And can you do some science to show us how it works? So the fact that the ROI was 0.92 versus 1.03 was not actually relevant to them. What mattered was that we could show it's more or less a good idea. There's some science to decide how to do it. And if we'd gone with a coarser analysis, we would have saved a few hundred thousand dollars and we could have used that money for implementation. So in other words, there really is a cost of doing more science than you need. And so that's kind of the, the heart of, of this topic of, of gathering just enough evidence is there's a cost of overdoing it that we don't always think about. So with that, here are some of the recommendations from the paper. So first is thinking through the type of data your audience needs. So that could be, is it quantitative or qualitative? Is it general or is it site specific? Is it a very precise and accurate number? Or is it an ordinal ranking where you just say, this is better than that? Then tailoring the type of evidence that you gather to the value of that information. So again, asking the question about whether or not more precision, more processing time, more rigor is really important or not. Third, thinking about adaptive management is really important. So if, you're, if you've only got one chance to design something the right way, and, and whatever you design is going to carry on for five or ten years, it's really important to do enough analysis to make sure you design it as well as possible and you're on the best trajectory. Conversely, if you have the opportunity to try something and every few months you go in and you measure on the ground and see what's working, what's not working, and you can adapt, well, you want to make sure you don't spend as much time up front doing research that you, you lose the ability to save resources for ongoing monitoring and adapting. So again, if you're working in an adaptive management framework, you probably can pull back on the initial science to make sure you, you've saved resources to do that. And then finally, making sure that the work plan that you're developing meets the decision deadline and need. So this is something, again, it, all these things sound super obvious, but can be really hard. So most of us as scientists are often asked to do things in a timeline that we think is unreasonable. And then the question is, what are your choices? So I've often been asked to do an analysis and I say, I can't do it. And in some cases, that just means they don't use any additional science. They keep on doing exactly what they're doing. So the question is, rarely for, for us as scientists, how much time do you need to do the analysis you're being asked for? And it's more, what can you tell me within the time and budget we have available? In some cases, it's absolutely appropriate to say, no, I can't do that for you. So I've been asked to do analyses where I say, to do what you're asking and the time and money you have would be worse than nothing because you're going to think you have actionable data and in fact you have a, a really unreliable hand-waving estimate that's, that's going to be mistaken for something real. And it's better for you just to go on being aware you have no real data to base this on. But conversely, I was asked one time to, to help a company think through sort of national procurement policies and, and what should they be doing on their grazing lands across the United States. And I knew I couldn't answer that question in the way it needed to be done totally accurately, totally robustly in a six month time period. But we did say, hey, well, we can give you some advice that's better than nothing. We can give you some advice that's going to allow you to make improvements. And if our choice is either to give you something in the six months that'll make an improvement or to do nothing and kind of hold out for more rigorous science, I'd rather have that partial improvement. So again, really thinking about the deadline and making sure we're being relevant is, is really important for us as scientists. And again, we probably know that, but we often say, well, we really need more time and that's not that often an option. Finally, and then we're just about ready for Q&A, sharing and discussing the evidence. And there's been quite a lot of, of information, a lot of discussion recently about science communication. So I don't think this is terribly novel, but still something most of us neglect. So first, having a really clear and compelling message. Um, any research you do should have you know, a sentence or two where you can clearly explain what you found and why it mattered. And that should be a message that's shared by the entire research team, by your partners and stakeholders. That should be kind of at the center point of a centerpiece of how you talk about it. The other thing is to create a communications plan early. Uh, most of us either don't do any communications plan or if we do, it's sort of a, a thing we slap on at the end. So I one time for that paper comparing 30 meters to half meter, I spent two hours doing a communication plan and spent about an hour and a half of you know, actual promoting it. And that was really great. It, it seemed like a lot of time at the time, but I got you know, several hundred interactions on Twitter and I got six really meaningful interactions in that first week from invitations to speak at a conference, invitations to collaborate, a few other scientists tell me that they thought it was really interesting, it was going to change how they worked. So we know communication plans can help, but if I'd done it at the beginning, if I'd thought through who are the people I want to influence, what are they going to trust or believe, 
what's the right format of data for them to see something as actionable? Should this be a technical piece or a general piece? But then early, I could have made sure that the research was actually supporting that communication um, need that I had from the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Third is improving your writing. Again, this is not shock, but most of us as scientists are not terribly talented as natural writers, and the peer review literature process doesn't tend to reward things like simplicity and succinctness, and so most of us can invest some time in improving our writing. That applies not only to blogs or non-technical writing, but even in a scientific journal article, you may have seen there's been some work in the literature arguing that, that writing in a more accessible way is helpful, because even when you're writing to other scientists, we all have different trainings, different backgrounds, we have different assumptions, and so spending some time to make sure that your, your writing is being received as you intended is really useful. So again, for example, even after this paper had been heavily edited by like 15 people, I ran it by you know, some other scientists, and there were still some things that, that we had not communicated clearly enough, or a couple of places where we, people thought we were saying the opposite of what we meant to say. So you can't say it enough, it's really important just to invest the time. And then finally, and this is a great one for, for Octo here, <clears throat> sharing things publicly as much as possible. So not only your paper and your summaries like blogs, but all the data in the code, and ideally that includes non-significant findings. So we all know about the, the bias problem of only publishing things that are significant. So it's also great to share the things you found that didn't work or that weren't significant. We've got a few other steps in the paper that aren't here, but I wanna kind of move on just so we have plenty of time for discussion. So that's the end of, of what we're going to do, uh, of sort of the content to talk about. I do want to add a few caveats before we jump to the discussion. So the first is that the authors, I mentioned there were four of us, so myself, Steve Wood, Mark Bradford, and Rod Kelsey, we are not a representative audience. Um, we are four white male scientists who currently live in America, and we realize that's a, a pretty tiny microcosm of people working in conservation globally. So, so that means we have a limited perspective, and we're sure that we miss things. We also didn't follow our own advice and work hard enough to retain some of the other people we started talking to, like decision makers and others in our product. So that shows this is hard to do. Um, following our own steps is a real pain in the butt. It was interesting and it was challenging, um, but I do want to note that it's, it's not easy and it really requires help. You don't need to be a science superhero and be an amazing communicator, an amazing policy analyst. You can work with colleagues who are experts in these things. So again, comms and policy and boundary spanners and others is really great to, to be able to add to your existing expertise. Third, this isn't comprehensive. So many of you probably know quite a bit about this topic or this space. There are many opinions and there's a heavy body of literature all about research impact. So we decided pretty early on, we wanted a paper that was short enough that people who were busy in conservation would, would have a chance of reading it. And that meant that we couldn't be comprehensive. So both our breadth and our depth were constrained. We made some intentional choices about what not to cover what to cover lightly. So for example, there's a rigorous body of literature on knowledge co-production, which we'll only touch on briefly. Um, there's questions around why scientists don't have enough incentive to have impact that we didn't touch at all. So this is not the final word. And then finally, and I mentioned this early, but I'll say it again, this is not the one true way. These are a set of guidelines that we think will be helpful. It's not a clear recipe you have to follow literally, and it's not a guarantee of success. You definitely need luck and persistence. I really look forward to hearing in the discussion what you all have found that's the most important for impact. <clears throat> I should also note that there are some folks who believe that guides like this are fundamentally impractical and unhelpful. So there was a, a great paper by Cardin Oliver in 2018 where they said, hey, these kind of, of, of simple guides just aren't useful. I can disagree, but I want to make sure I'm, I'm flagging the point that not everyone thinks this is useful. So with that, I'd like to open it up. Um, so again, some possible questions. How does this align with your experience? What do you think is missing or wrong? What seems right? How might this be more useful? And then for those of you that are interested, um, the links here, so if you go to bit.ly slash stronger science, that's a link to the full um, paper, which as I said is, is in um, review right now with a journal, but you can read it as a preprint. That's my email and my Twitter handle if you've got any other thoughts or questions. And with that, I think I'm ready to take any, any questions. And I believe um, Sarah and Ray are gonna moderate that to, to flag things. That's right, okay. Um, so thank you so much, John. This was great. So to remind everyone um, to ask questions, you can type them into the Q&A or the chat. Um, and the chat, you have the option of sending just to the panelists or sending to the entire audience. Uh, okay, great. We already have a bunch of questions. Um, you've answered some of them by, by putting the link to the preprint. Um, we'll start off, let's see. As retired marine scientists and grassroots environment environmental activists, 
I find that a big challenge is being data rich scientifically, but information poor when dealing with diverse constituents. Scientists are not often the best to carry out science translation to elected officials, uh, policymakers, and the concerned public. Uh, what are the best solutions to this challenge? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And again, for, for all these things, take as a given. I don't have all the answers, so I'll give you some thoughts, but I don't um, pretend to be the, the sole expert or sole authority on this. So I guess two thoughts. I think it really depends on, on your context, so whether you're at a um, academic institution or a nonprofit or a government agency or in private business. So I think the first question is, is who else you have in addition to scientists to work with? So for example, um, working at nonprofits, we typically have policy experts, people who, whether they're lobbyists or whether they're analysts, we have people that do understand those, those needs better. So I'd say starting with them to say, hey, help, help me understand. I'd like to have a meeting to fully understand what are the, the information needs? What are the decision needs that they have and have them help with the translation? If that's not an option, I think a lot of it is just having the humility to ask questions. So many of us as scientists, our default is sort of to assume we have the answer and we just need to tell people what we know and then they'll be wiser. But we don't often ask what people really need and, and, and how they think about the topic we're working on. So, so for example, there was a great paper recently that looked at the Forest Service and they, and they were interviewing these decision makers and they found that while they thought science was important, they also thought that public consensus was really important. And so just fundamentally recognizing that they are thinking about more things than just science, they're thinking about public opinion, right or wrong, can be helpful to understand, you know, okay, yes, you can provide the science, but you shouldn't expect that just because science says you should do X, that means they'll do X. So not that helps, but I think a lot of it's really just about having those conversations early, learning, asking questions, um, challenging your assumptions, and wherever possible, relying on other experts that, that have experience making those translations. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, great. So there's a couple people who have asked about the slides and recording of the presentation. And I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, usually within a, a day or two, we uh, post all the recordings. Uh, it, this is being recorded and the recording will go up at um, uh, www.openchannels.org slash webinars. And I'll, I'll post that in the chat as well. Um, so let's see, another question. What is your best advice for an effective communications plan? What platforms are effective tools? What's the role of a press release? Well, that's a great question. I'm gonna, I think mostly punt on that one. I don't think I actually have the answer because I'm not a communications expert. So I've only done a few of these and I've done them in partnership with other colleagues who are full-time science communicators. Um, so I would love to hear from other people. If others have suggestions, maybe you could put that in the chat as well. I, I can say for myself, um, just thinking through the process of the communication plan, I think the most important thing is thinking through from the beginning, again, who's your audience or partner? Who do you want to, to do something in response to your research? And so thinking through the sequence of things that have to happen. So somebody has to be made aware of your research. They have to read it or hear a presentation on it. They have to believe it. They have to choose to act on it. And so as you think through at a high level what those steps are, that kind of gives you some starting points about who are the likely actors or stakeholders. So, you know, maybe you want the governor to take action, but the governor is going to take action only if their staff or a certain scientific council believes it. And so as you think through that sequence of events, you start to get a sense of who is it that you want to target? What is it they're most likely to find interesting or compelling? And you can start to have conversations with them. And again, that's one of the reasons I like doing it early is if for a couple of papers I've worked on, I had a preconception of what I thought would be useful to my target audience, and I'd ask them. And sometimes it turned out that that was totally wrong. Uh, so again, thinking about that one paper uh, with the, the data resolution, it turned out that some people were really interested in the topic, but they were interested in it sort of at a high level, thinking about you know grant making, thinking about research design. There was a different group of people who were remote sensing specialists who had really different questions, and I had actually originally only been thinking about the latter group. I've been thinking about how I can make a very technical set of recommendations. So when I found out that there was broader interest and they actually didn't care about, you know, which satellite to use and all these criteria, I actually had to adjust the research a bit. So I made it possible to, to ask the, to answer the other questions people were answering. So I don't know if that, that's not a very good answer because I, I don't, I'm not an expert in the communications piece and I've been very fortunate to work with other others who are, but at least it's a start. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, there's a, re a lot of really great questions, so um, hopefully we'll have a, a chance to get to quite a few. Um, another one, do you think universities and grad schools are well equipped to train scientists that want to have impacts on policy? What is missing and what resources should be improved? Hmm, that's, a, that's another really interesting question. Um, I think the answer is, is yes, it's certainly a start, and I've had some great conversations with a number of universities about this topic. 
So I think some of the things that are ideal at universities is I think it's possible to be seen as, as nonpartisan, not as an advocate. So I think that can buy you credibility. Um, I also think universities are often in a position to build long-term relationships with policymakers or other decision makers, which can be really fortunate or really important. I think the literature talks a lot about how important it is often to build long-term relationships. I think some of the things that, that in my experience, universities are, are not quite as good at, I think, again, thinking about the timelines and thinking about, um, you know, how to do something that's, that's good enough is not typically how, how universities are, are based. So most universities don't reward faculty or other staff for, for real world impacts. They reward them for high impact publications. And so the idea of doing something that's a little bit more on the quick and dirty side to meet a really key deadline because there's an opportunity is not usually something that universities are, are quite as well positioned to do. So I think it's great, again, to have the, the deep depth, the intellectual rigor, those long-term relationships and the lack of bias, I think, are, are really essential. I think that's a great place to start. I think it's really good talking to NGOs and people who often have more of an advocacy basis. Um, and then especially to actually talk to people who work in the policy shop. Again, many of, of, um, of my assumptions about kind of what people's needs are have been totally wrong. And there's, there's another interesting subset of the literature that talks specifically about what decision makers value and what policymakers value um, and where they think of science as useful or not. So I think academics have a great place to start. And I think, again, as with all things in science, you know, start with what you hear to be true and then test it, challenge it, figure out what else you're missing and figure out how you can learn from people beyond academia. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, another question, do any of your recommendations change or vary in importance if we distinguish by types of science? Uh, for example, many studies might focus on adding detail to natural or physical science dimensions of a problem, but gloss over the human side of conservation. However, many most conservation problems are actually people problems rather than ecological ones. And um, maybe we need different kinds of science sometimes. Yes, that's another interesting question. So thinking about the social side and I think especially when you're working, and again, I'm, I'm not a social scientist, I've done much less um, on that side. So again, I'll, I'll give some opinions, but weigh them more lightly. Um, one thing I have found in working with communities is how it's, it's often a very different perspective on, on what's treated as knowledge or what's treated as authoritative information. So for example, I, I was talking recently to some scientists who work with indigenous communities in the Western United States and conversations around, well, how do you value historical oral knowledge relative to what, you know, Western science thinks of as empiric scientific fact is really interesting. It, it's something, you know, again, most of us, our training says, well, the most authoritative information comes from a peer reviewed journal and you don't necessarily treat, you know, oral history the same way, but in some communities, that's sort of a non-starter. So again, I think um, understanding as, as especially physical or biological scientists, just having a, a moment to pause and think how much we don't know in the social science realm is really important. So I've learned a lot about what are some of the questions to ask, um, how do you listen to people? How do you, you know, ask clarifying questions? Um, and ultimately, how do you have some of the, the tough discussions when, when values conflict? Um, but yeah, so I think absolutely that the science you need to do is different. And in many cases, it's not really about the rigor of the science. It's more about having an inclusive process. So, so one of the, the topics I really like in the literature talks about um, credibility, legitimacy, and um, salient. So, you know, is it credible means is it rigorous enough? Is the science right? Legitimate means do people believe in it? Have they had a stake in it? Do they see it as, as something that they, you know, they believe in? And then uh, salience is, is it relevant? And so that, that middle piece, legitimacy, is often where this comes in. And so I have another paper that was actually um, just accepted that I was a minor author on this last week. And it has to do with that story I told in Brazil. This paper had a really interesting finding. So the, the decision makers thought it was really important that we did something that they thought of as rigorous science. They didn't actually think it was important what the recommendations of that science were. So in other words, they thought it was important that as a community and working with stakeholders that, you know, we did science that would tell us this makes sense, but they were less interested in the specific recommendations. And that was a complete surprise to us. Those of us who, who were working as the modelers, we thought the most important thing was the product, but to them, the most important thing was the process. And again, that, those are the kinds of things that can offer diff, often differ in a social versus physical environment that can be really hard to predict if, if you don't have experience with it. So I think definitely starting by, by talking to people with different expertise is a great way to begin. Okay, thank you, John. Um, we'll take a little break from asking questions and I'm going to share some, uh, some thoughts from some of our, uh, our, our great. participants. All right, so first of all, we'll start, um, this is from Peter Oster. So great presentation. 
Two things. First, a useful recommendation to add to the guidelines is to ensure practitioners understand the laws, policy, and regulations inherent to addressing the problem. In the mm. U.S. at the federal level, uh, that is NEPA and things like Magnuson-Stevens Act or San Sanctuaries Act. Second, is advice to people in different settings with different reward systems. Academics and tenure track need to bring in grant money, write papers in high impact journals, et cetera. Conservation progress is great, but in gen generally won't get you tenure. It is possible to do both, I do, but ensuring that all masters are satisfied is important. Scientists mm. at NGOs have different measures of success. It's useful to differentiate this. Yeah, great point. Um, let's see, and there was another, let's see. Uh, Okay, and there is another uh, thought, and this is from Lauren Garska, and I can't see the rest of the name. Sorry, it's cut off. All right. But I noticed that you frame the communication effort in the context of written formats, mm. um, w whether publications, reports, blogs, etc., to the public, and public in quotes. And while generally valuable, I would emphasize that the more immediate is the direct and strategic communication with decision makers who will use it. And this goes back to your comment regarding simpler writing being more accessible so that knowledge is transferred with accuracy. Forums with opportunity for discussion with end users allow for bridging vocabularies, vocabularies relating through discussion and yielding the richness of the study in a more meaningful way. This is something we've observed through studies on technical knowledge transmission and the impact of various communication channels. Expert interaction generally offers the most effective translation of science to policy and management decisions. Yeah, it's a fantastic point. I completely agree. And I think we talk about that some in the paper and so I probably misrepresented by focusing on the written. I think what it comes down to is, is ultimately, like I said, early on understanding who is your audience, your partner, and, and how do they most want to, to, to learn or discuss with you? And so in many cases, that is, you know, showing up at city council meetings or stakeholder meetings or working one-on-one -on -one with policymakers. Um, in some cases, the written piece is really important. So, you know, you talk a lot about the importance of having a policy brief or working with corporate partners. They have a, a different set of preferences. But yeah, it absolutely should be driven by the actual needs of the people you want to influence rather than sort of a preconceived notion that it, it should be written or it should be anything else. So thank you for the, the point. Okay. Um, I also, there's, there's one other one I wanted to pull out. I, I saw, I, I made, this is a, my error. So somebody made the point that we shouldn't use the phrase dumbing down as it implies intellectual disparities. So that, that's a really good point. Um, and I also should, should say when I listed that as kind of a concern people had, that's not to say that I, I think it's right. Um, I can say for myself, I used to think sometimes of like people would tell me, oh, you need to speak more slowly. You've probably noticed I talk very quickly. You need to, to talk more simply. And I was like, oh, you know, these people, they just, they don't understand. Like, I like watching people give talks, which are super technical. And then I went to a, a conservation science conference and I realized that there were some people who gave brilliant talks where they spoke slowly and clearly and didn't use jargon. And that in reality, what I, what I had thought of as, as quote, dumbing down was actually just people doing a better job of communicating in a way that was still accessible, still compelling, still specific enough. So it's a really good point that both the phrase is unhelpful and also we are probably wrong if we, if we think that the problem is we're going to be too simple. Not that it's not possible, but most of the time we make the opposite mistake and end up being too technical or, or too specific. And that's, again, where having the comms plan, running it by different colleagues is, is just invaluable to understand how people receive the information you're trying to share or whatever the format. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, and then there was another comment. Um, and it's, I'm not sure that recommending uh, better communication will work. As scientists, uh, we do not, we're not science communication experts. Do you think that the other actors can be at the table when writing? Uh, we may need to have a policymaker and an industry representative or farmers be part of the papers. And we may need to engage journalists more often. However, what I think is the best way of doing it is to work with artists, writers, visual, performing art. And there, there's some really cool examples of this. So another thought. Yeah, I think that's another, another great thought. And I think, um, yeah, I think, I don't, again, I don't think there's any one way to do it. Um, and again, it certainly just doesn't mean you have to do it yourself. It, it does mean that, again, many of us by default think of, of communications as something we shouldn't spend much time doing. And so again, literally spending four years from writing a grant to having a, a publication, I still resented spending a day and a half 
even just myself on doing communication. And, and when I think about it, that's, that's pretty ridiculous. So at least for myself and many of my colleagues that have spoken to over the year, all, our default is, is putting aside the expertise question is that this isn't a good use of our time. And I personally have found that my instincts on that are wrong. So yeah, whether it's working with artists or performance artists or, or farmers or stakeholders or whoever else it is, um, one way or another, we should make sure we're spending time sharing the, the research with people that need to see it. Okay. Um, there's also several questions uh, dealing with timelines and time frames, and I'll, re I'll just read a couple of them. Um, it's how can we bring the science forward in a four-year election cycle and development tax dollars? It is often hard for the results to rise to the surface. Um, another one that, that sort of brings up the idea of time frames, it can take quite a long time for policymakers to make changes to their policies. This can be done beyond the lifetime of a research grant. So how can you demonstrate pathways to impact as well as actual impact um, measured by policy changes to funders, et cetera? Hmm. Re really interesting questions there. Um, I think the question of how to demonstrate impact to funders is, is a pretty interesting one. I had a, a really great discussion with a series of folks at foundations uh, when I gave a, a different version of this talk back in May. I don't think there's one right answer. Um, and again, I, I know some people are on this call who have a lot more experience. So, so people sometimes measure things like you know, how many meetings do you have? Um, do you see evidence that somebody is using your language or citing your report or sharing it? Um, you know, can you can you show over time inertia and kind of a, and a, people are, are using something that you produced? And, and I, it's such a broad topic, I'm, I'm hesitant to try to give a, a pat answer to it. Um, I guess the only thing I, I can say is I think there are sort of always sort of two goals. One is you, you typically have sort of a, a very proximate objective. So maybe it's for the next farm bill, you want to make sure that you identify the most strategic way to target which lands to improve water quality or, you know, whatever it else is. You might have a, a proximate goal, but the other thing I found really helpful working with colleagues who do long-term policy work is they also have a sense of what's sort of the broader strategic arc of the stakeholders you're working with. So you might say, okay, here's our target. We want to get this language into the farm bill in three years. However, They've been having these discussions about how to use, you know, equip money or whatever for the last 30 years, and we know it's going to be going forward for 30 more. So even if you don't hit this deadline, here are the types of things that are going to be important. Here are the people we need to talk to now, which may or may not let us hit our deadline, but are going to be important in building those long-term relationships and, and, and heading for the next target. So I think sometimes you really do have a single uh, short-term opportunity where once the window closes, that's it and there's not going to be a ton of relevance other times and you know often um, work can be relevant in ways you didn't expect it to or didn't intend it to eventually and that's where i think yeah understanding so people who know those you know what is the the policy landscape what happens in 2020 with new elections or you know what happens in 2018 as we've all these changes because again most of us just can't keep track of of it and so asking people for help on what, what are the conversations they've been having short term but also what are some of the long-term trends who might be retiring and maybe newly interested in, in champion something, um, you know, what is it that they get excited about? Is it about showing economic value? Is it about showing conservation value? What's the, the, the unit of motivation that really gets them excited? Those are some of the things I think are important because some of those will be short-term and proximate, but some of them will be pretty long-term and durable. Okay, thank you, John. Um, so sort of, sort of on the same subject and, and uh, talking about working with uh, stakeholders. Um, there's a question. You mentioned that you lost touch with the original audience that you were trying to inform and engage. Uh, what do you believe was lost from that disconnect? Uh, how would you recommend maintaining relationships from early stages to final sharing? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so what was lost? I think we probably pulled more towards writing the paper that we felt like we needed as, as the authors. So for example, I often tell people what got me motivated was I wanted to write a paper that I could kind of give to myself 15 years ago when I was starting out to sort of avoid all the mistakes I made and build on the success I've had. So I think our paper is, is no, no doubt aimed mostly at conservation scientists in NGOs and academia, because that's kind of who we are. And so I think the question on the other side of how do you make it most use, useful and relevant for decision makers, you know, we got input from people, but it wasn't as strong, it wasn't as robust. And so some of the, the conversations I've had since indicates that, yeah, there are different topics we probably should have, should have covered more. Um, that's certainly a possibility for follow-on work. So I think that's, that's part of what we lost. As far as how to get there, I think for myself, probably my two biggest lessons learned are, are first, the need to be patient, which is not a, a core strength of mine. So, for example, you know, some of the people that originally were interested in, in collaborating on this, you know, they wouldn't respond. And after 
three months, I'd be like, look, if, if we're all not going to work on this, then, you know, we're not going to be co-authors. That was probably a mistake in, in retrospect. I probably should have targeted at least a few people that I thought were really important and asked the question, okay, how could you participate? Rather than assuming that the way they should participate is what I was asking for, which is relatively short term, you know, over a month's time scale, back and forth on sequential drafts. So that, that would have helped. And I think the other one is really, um, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, thinking about the validity of, of different ways of thinking. So, you know, just because the scientific literature says X doesn't mean that that's the sole authority. And I think my tendency is to more heavily weight, here's what the literature found, and to less heavily weight, here's sort of experiential learning. And as I talk to people who work in the policy space, it's often the reverse. Um, they see science as useful, of course, but often it's, it's as useful to kind of complement or supplement what they know from the work they've done. And I think if we had done as authors a little more work to really be humble and think about what we could learn from people who, who don't work as scientists, we would have had a stronger product. Um, that being said, we haven't had super strong critique or, or really, you know, we haven't gotten a sense that we got it dead wrong from the people we've talked to since, but they also might be being polite. So <laughs> again, I'd love direct and blunt feedback from any folks on the phone, whether it's now or whether it's by email later. Okay. All right. Well, I'm sure they're getting out their typing fingers. All right. Uh, let's see. There is a question. Can you discuss the relative roles of peer reviewed publication versus white papers mm -hmm. with multiple co-authors? Sure. Yeah, I think both, um, both are certainly useful. I guess the thing that I've, um, I'll say two things that I guess have kind of surprised me. And again, many things may be obvious to others here. The first is that I've been surprised how often when I work with um, decision makers, and in my case, it's mostly been private or corporate, but I've also worked with, with some government folks. Um, peer reviewed journal articles are, are seen as better in general, but there's often a, a much, much lower bar of scientific credibility than I expect. That's true for a written product. It's true in person. So um, I've been in rooms where, where I literally at one point only had kind of like a hundred level soil science course and I was treated as a soil science expert. That was distressing to me, um, but for the purpose of that meeting, it was still true enough. And so I think the one thing is that again, my, my default is always to pull for more peer reviewed, you know, more rigorous journal, more rigorous. Um, and oftentimes decision makers don't really care. They don't care as much as we think we do. And yes, they'll notice if it's peer reviewed, they'll notice if it's in science or nature. But for the most part, they don't place nearly as much distinction as, as we tend to as scientists. So I guess that's the first. And again, that, that means that the, you can do a lot more research faster if you're not committing to peer review. So for example, one research product I did for a corporate partner took about six months. We produced a white paper that informed their supply chain. I, I later found out a different corporation found the report. We didn't even tell them about it. They just found it online and they were using it. Um, and we then later on tried to go back and publish it. And we kind of got the comment, hey, this looks like kind of a quick analysis done for a corporate audience and not a peer reviewed article. And, and they were right. That's exactly what it was. Um, we did kind of as much science as we could to meet our deadline. And we didn't try to do really comprehensive modeling. And so in the end, we decided it was too much work to publish, but I still am glad we produced the white paper. So I think I think that's useful. At the same time, I do think from a long-term perspective, um, you know, white papers are great in the moment. I think it's often the case that over the long run, when you talk about research being used in a way it wasn't originally intended for, people do obviously find things in the peer-reviewed literature. And so whether it's, you know, Web of Science or Google Scholar, having things in the peer-reviewed literature does give it sort of a, a I don't want to say permanence, but a longer-term set of legs that it doesn't always have with white papers. And so I, I have seen cases where I put something in, in a um, peer reviewed article that, that had a lot of um, longer term impact. But then actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there is, a, there is one book chapter I wrote, which actually just came out this year after about five years after I submitted the final version. And I had written a blog about it just because I thought the core finding was really interesting. It was showing that total global agricultural land area had been going down since the 80s until a few years ago. And I was like, wow, that's really surprising. I should put that out there. And because there was that five-year lag between when I had a blog available and when the peer-reviewed version came out, um, I've actually seen that blog get cited by other peer-reviewed publications just because it was the only place at the time that, that was being cited. So again, I definitely think there's a role for both. That was a very long way to say that very simple thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, John. Uh, we still have a lot of great questions, so um, we still have time for quite a few more, but um, I just wanted to let everyone know all the questions will be passed on to John, so he'll be able to see them after the webinar. Uh, so let's see. Um, did 
the question, did you look at or consider the cost benefits of working with a particular specific audience and the ability to reuse that tool or research for another audience with a slightly different question? Sometimes it seems like if you work with a particular audience, then your work can get narrowed too far for that specific purpose mm -hmm. and limit its reuse. Uh, did this get looked at at all? That's a really interesting question. I think the short answer is no. I don't think we thought too hard about it. Um, and I think it's a good point that yes, the more you're trying to align yourself with a very proximate or, or short term use, it may well be possible that you're losing the longer term applicability. Um, I guess the only thing I'd say is at least again for myself and, and the, the folks I've talked about this, our tendency has been a bit by default to go in the other direction to answer the general and to, to neglect the specific. So ideally, I think there's a mix of both where you say, yes, here's the specific person I want to influence right now. And I want to make sure I'm not only producing something for them, but also having something that can be used more broadly. So it's, it's a really good question. I need to go back and probably see if I can tweak the paper to make sure we, we say that explicitly. So point well taken. Okay. Um... And then moving back to the sort of white paper versus published, um, do you have any suggestions for a sort of middle ground between just doing uh, your own analysis aimed at a few uh, policymakers and pull, full peer review? For example, is getting comments from a few relevant scientists or circulating with external colleagues on a shorter time scale an option? Yeah, those, those are great questions. And so I think the answer is absolutely. So, um, so thinking about work I've done, I've, I've done everything from, you know, something with no peer review whatsoever to obviously lots of peer reviewed literature. Um, and yeah, so some of the models that have worked in between. So, so this paper, um, I think, as I mentioned, this is currently in review at a journal, but we've got about 20 pretty formal inline sets of edits from, from, from other people. So it's funny when I tell people, Hey, this isn't a published journal article, but it, it is, it has been peer reviewed. I don't say it's a peer reviewed publication because people think that means it's been accepted and it hasn't. But in some ways, it's, it's pretty robust. On the other hand, most of those are people that I know, and those people are probably being more polite than they would if they were anonymous, right? So I, I want to be really clear that there is value in having that really um, direct anonymous feedback. So I've also done white papers um, where I've, I've solicited through a third party anonymous uh, feedback. So there's a paper I worked on where we got three fairly high level people to treat it as if it was a journal article. But we didn't want to go through the trouble of, you know, actually publishing it. Um, so that was also helpful. I think on the short, the, the, the easier side is, yeah, running it through a few, a few colleagues and ideally um, being really, really clear what you want to get out of it. Do you really want them to point out major red flags? Do you want them to help make the language better? Do you want them to be as direct as possible or only to let you know if they see a huge problem? Because I think often when we're asked to provide feedback from people we know, it can be hard to be um, direct and to be frank. So I think just being really clear and saying, hey, I've got to put this out in three weeks. I would love your comments in, along these lines. Um, and one, one last thought, because this is something I thought was really cool. I used to work um, when I was the Nature Conservancy. We had an internal peer review help desk. This was a process where scientists would email me saying, I've got the following. Maybe it's something to go for peer review. Maybe it's a white paper. Maybe it's a blog, whatever. But they would say, here's the paper. Here's the, the written product. And here's where I want help. So one time somebody would say, hey, I'm really worried about the stats. Can you get me an expert? One time somebody's like, hey, I really want some people who understand, you know, remote sensing of coral or, hey, can you get me some fire ecologists to look at this? Because I'm not totally sure about that. And we would provide them anonymous peer review as if it was at a journal, but we would just do it informally and in internally. And it was great because people would sometimes get really strong feedback um, that there was a major problem and they had to, to think hard about moving forward. Sometimes they got some spit and polish. Sometimes they got, you know, substantial edits. Um, so I think it, it's a really good question. I think there are many, many useful viable options for ways to get peer review, um, whether it's for peer for a, a journal article or something more informal. Okay, thank you, John. Um, another interesting question which came up, um, you had said just having just enough information. Uh, do you know of any decision support tools that help you with figuring out um, what just enough information is? Um, also, how, how do risk and uncertainty and urgency factor into scaling the scientific rigor in an optimal way? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So maybe start with the second part. I think that's easier. So yeah, that's actually something we talk about a good bit in the, in the paper is there's no right answer for how much is enough, but, but it's all about framing sort of trade-offs and saying, hey, I can give you this answer with this time on this budget, and you just need to accept that there's this much risk, we're going to get it wrong. Or we can reduce the risk in this way, but here's what it's going to do to the timeline, or it's going to be more specific and less general than you want. 
So I think being really explicit about those, those trade-offs is, is critical. So people are making an informed decision. As far as decision support systems, um, I don't, I'm not an expert. There are a number of things that I think get at it. So there's conservationevidence.com, which is a, a website um, run by, by Bill Sutherland, I believe, and some colleagues, which begins to collect evidence on different topics. You can use a site like that to say, well, what do we know? And often that, that research is, is very site specific or, but it, you know, there's a question, well, can I generalize this? And what would it cost me? How much uncertainty or variability is there? Um, I'm trying to think of other good ones and I don't know offhand, but again, if anyone has, has a suggestion in the chat, I'd, I'd love to hear them. We don't talk a ton about specific tools in the paper. Um, and it's a good question. I'm, I'm almost certain there are some that I'm not spending enough time thinking about right now. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Um, let's see. Sure. And there was an, another comment. So great presentation and discussion. Uh, there's a comment uh, regarding peer review versus white papers. White papers or even a presentation, discussion, et cetera, may be all that's needed to help inform a decision. In those cases, mm. it's more about trust in you as an expert, your objectivity, mm. and your aim to help them make their decision. Yeah, I think, I think it's dead on. Again, it's understanding what is the information needs. Does it have to be peer reviewed? Is it talk good enough? Do you have to have a certain pedigree or is just being a person who has read about something enough? Do you have to have published on it? So yeah, it's really asking the question of, of what legitimate or, or credible is going to be for that audience. Okay. And, and a question. Um, hi, Mr. Fisher. Thank you very much for your lovely presentation. I was wondering if we could allot a bit of time to discuss how interdisciplinarity is important for producing meaningful and impactful research. I mean this also from the proposal and hypothesis phase um, in order to respond to questions that are relevant to many stakeholders and taking into account points of view we might be missing from our own discipline. Yeah, I think that's another, another really good point. So we, we touched on this a bit, I think, with the earlier question comment about the importance of social science and, you know, kind of asking questions about how the, the which disciplines you need might vary in different contexts. Um, so, yeah, I think, again, if in the literature, the, the work on, on knowledge co-production and boundary spanning talks about this a lot, the value of whether it's interdisciplinarity or, or multidisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity, um, but it's all in different different angles about, you know, different different folks with different expertise and different lived experiences and backgrounds. Um, I can certainly say for myself, I, I am continually surprised how much I don't know that I wouldn't expect I didn't know and how much, um, you know, I'm enhanced by talking to whether it's economists or, you know, even people who have a similar background, but maybe they're more about a specific hydrological background than I have. Um, and I guess the last thought that, that I think is, is really interesting is there's been some disciplines that, if I'm being totally honest, I've, I've kind of probably written off as not terribly relevant, but I've heard some really compelling stories of. So, for example, I was talking to somebody who's on a National Academy of Sciences panel about gene editing and genetic engineering, and they mentioned that they've had some really good conversations with ethicists and philosophers, so non-scientists. And that the perspective they've brought about, well, how would you think through some of the questions and how do you think through governance and some of the, the trade-offs and ethics are, are fundamentally different tools than most of us have as, again, mostly biological or physical scientists. So I think it's, it's a great point. And the only other, you know, the only countervailing point I have is that I do think in some cases it, it can feel paralyzing, feeling like, well, there's so many people I should talk to or I could talk to, and you can feel stuck. And so my, my default is to sort of Seek out as much perspective as you can, but also kind of always keeping what's your timeline, what are the resources you have, and make sure you don't end up, um, you know, letting the perfect being the enemy of good. But overall, I think it's a great point. I, I really enjoy learning from people with different backgrounds. Okay, thank you, John. Um, last question. Um, how prevalent is the need for new evidence versus a synthesis of evidence that already exists? Uh, the paper explores how to design and frame new science, but others in the sector I talk with say we're awash in evidence and need synthesis. Mm. Thoughts on where the bulk of the need lies? Yeah, that's a great point. I think it really differs depending on, on what your specific topic is. So, um, so for example, I know, um, I think I saw Johannes Lehman is on, on the call right now. I'm like, we've had some really interesting conversations in soil science where there are some things that are genuinely not known, but mostly it's like, well, we have a ton of, we actually have less uncertainty, and more variability. And so, you know, there's more work needed to really summarize that. And I think from a, from a decision maker standpoint, it often is the synthesis and summary that's, that's most critical, but you can't synthesize something that's not there. Um, so for example, um, I did a lot of work in sustainable agriculture and there are often these questions of, okay, again, what would be really good range management practices for carbon, for biodiversity, for water quality? And sometimes it's really hard to generalize those things. 
But so figuring out what's the right um, unit of summary, what's the right spatial summary uh, unit, what's the right temporal unit is really important. Um, but again, there are some things where there really are some kind of surprising gaps and things that are fundamentally not known. And so I guess in, for this paper, we, we kind of treat research um, as a broad umbrella that covers both types, both generating totally new information and synthesizing or summarizing existing information in a way that yields new insights. Um, and if I had to, to guess, I'd say they're probably right that there's probably more of a need on synthesis and summary than the novel evidence. But I will say I continue to be surprised at what things we just don't know at all um, in a number of very specific and technical areas where it really matters. Okay. All right. We're going to wrap up here. First of all, I want to thank not just John, but all of our, our participants today, because you truly were participants. This was great discussion and comments and, and questions. And uh, we so appreciate uh, you being here and, and taking the time to, uh, to, to participate like this. And John, this was just fabulous. The initial, all, all the work you've been doing, the presentation, and then uh, the discussion we had at the end. Uh, this was actually our largest webinar ever. We, I think we, we we uh, bested our previous record by a little bit. And um, I think we will try and uh, host um, a similar webinar, same topic and with any updates uh, that John has uh, sometime in 2020 for, uh, for anyone who would like to join again and uh, those who weren't able to join us today. Uh, so again, thank you everyone. And th thank you, especially John for, for doing this. Yeah, and thank you for hosting and thanks to everyone for the interest. And again, please do, any thoughts, questions, critiques by email later. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, great. And th thanks all and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, take care. Bye.